Hello everyone, uh, Boroda. My name is Peter Beresford and I, I've got two backgrounds really. I work and have long worked in a university, Essex University, but also uh, as someone who's had mental health issues, um, I've been involved for a long time in what we call user-led organisations and in my case that's shaping our lives. And please do check our website. I've, I've long been interested, and I'm not really sure why, I sometimes wonder about it. Um, I've always been interested in how people can have more control, more say in their lives. Uh, that, that's, that's been a central focus of my work, and that's been work both as an academic, as a researcher, as a teacher, but also doing things uh, in local communities with other people, trying to make change. So it, it's been that preoccupation with how can we have more say that's, that's guided the work that I've done. And I've done it in all kinds of ways. I've been lucky. I've been involved in uh, user-led organisations where with people with similar experiences, in my case having had mental health problems, uh, we've got together to try and make things better for people like us. But I've also been privileged um, more in the past because of changes in politics in, in, in this country, in the UK, to be involved at a, a kind of higher level working with government, trying to make change there. Uh, my feeling always is that if you want to make change, you need to work top down, but also crucially bottom up. You need to work to make change uh, with people who want to make that change for their lives and those of people like them. So it, it's about how we can live in a better world and have better lives, but not working on the principle that other people can tell us best, uh, which I think with good intention still a rather paternalistic approach, but working on the principle that people do tend, when they're given the chance to work it out, to know best what they want, what they need, and to be helped and supported to play a, a very active role in making that happen. Although people often think that research is irrelevant, um, and people who are not familiar with research can feel, and I understand that feeling, Oh, it's all about the ivory tower, it's about doing this stuff, asking people the obvious, getting the obvious answers as if it was important, writing it up in very difficult gobbledygook language, and then it, it sits and gets dusty on a shelf in a university. There's lots of research that I wish that was its fate, that it did actually end up ignored on a university shelf. The truth is that public policy social policy, the services we have, has to have some kind of a knowledge base. There is that sense that we need to know whether things work or whether they don't. And welfare reform, for example, which we know has been very punitive to many disabled people, has had a research basis. But it's research of a particular sort, and that's what we need to remember, that research is not just one thing. And historically, uh, for example, with the creation of the welfare state and the development of social policy before that even, uh, research has been a very particular sort of thing. There's been this idea of research as scientific. It, it, it's something that men in white coats do. And often when, they, when you see TV adverts and they're telling you to buy uh, this makeup or that, they'll have a man in a white coat telling you to buy this toothpaste or whatever, because that's how people think of it. And people think of research as, as things like um, experimenting on people to get results or uh, interviewing people in a quite mechanical way uh, uh, to draw in uh, their opinion. And, and this kind of research which is known as positivist research which sees itself as very scientific and reliable and is fated, valued as perhaps the most important and rigorous way of getting knowledge research to produce knowledge, what we know, um, um, my opinion has always been a problem for people on the receiving end of policy and services. That's because of its principles. This research, which seeks to be scientific, and you could ask questions about, can you be scientific about people in the same way that you can be scientific about bits of stone or chemicals? I would ask that question, but it's had three key underpinning values that to do good research, it has to be objective, it has to be neutral, and it has to be uh, distanced from its subject. 
And I can see why people would come to a conclusion like that. It must be neutral. Oh, you, you, you shouldn't have some bias. Uh, it must be objective. You shouldn't let your personal opinion get in the way. It should be distance. Oh, you shouldn't be a rich person doing research about rich people saying rich people are jolly good. Do you get my... The trouble with all that is when it comes down to doing research in relation to, with and about people who face discrimination, exploitation and difficulties, what you are saying is, oh, well, we can't really take for granted what they would find out or what they would say because you can hardly say they're distant from the experience. You can hardly say they're objective. It's happening to them. And why would they be neutral? They have feelings about it. And, and it worried me, this, because I thought to myself, for goodness sake, when white people were doing research on black people, men doing research on women, heterosexuals doing research on people who were gay, all of which have been historically the case, they came to some very weird and worrying conclusions about those groups, uh, usually which put those groups down as inferior and a problem. Uh, and it seems to me quite possible the same would happen here. But there's something even more frightening. If what you're saying then is those people who face problems and difficulties, like disabled people or mental health service users or older people, are too close to, can't be neutral about and wouldn't be objective about their experience, then what you're also saying is that as people who know, they are inferior knowers. What people have come to call epistemic injustice. I don't like those fancy words. I think what we're talking about is favouring some people's knowledge and devaluing other people's knowledge. So then what it means is if you're a woman, historically, or if you're a disabled person, not only uh, is it likely you face discrimination in the world simply because of who you are. But then if you try and report your side of the story, you face a whole additional level of discrimination because people will say, well, you can't believe what they say because they're, they're not going to be neutral and independent about it. Uh, so why would we trust them? And that's a terrifying consequence. It means that you would be saying, I cannot believe those people in the same way that I can believe a researcher because they are qualified, they are expert, and they are outside the issue. And for me, and I don't want to devalue these ideas, it's a kind of devaluing of first-hand experience, which does have relationships with those people who denied the Holocaust. You are saying that what they tell you, what they say happened, doesn't mean anything, or they were just in it. Whereas I think what service users have been saying is, we're not saying we've got a better claim to knowledge than academics or researchers, but we're saying we've got an equal one. We can add something to the picture. So stop devaluing what we know from our lived experience, what people are now calling experiential knowledge, and put it in there because it will help give us a fuller and complete picture of what we're trying to find out about. And there are still really big barriers to user-controlled research, even to a research where people are partners with traditional researchers in terms of how the funding is, is allocated, for example. But I think the argument's beginning to be one that such lived experience, the engagement of people with that experience to be part of a research process, uh, is really important and overdue. And I think that's one of the great successes and good things that have come out of the pressure for user involvement. That's one. And the other one, I think, is the way in which increasingly in professional education, people who are the subjects of those professionals' work, uh, you know, people ill, people with mental health problems, disabled people, children in care, all those groups are becoming more actively and more equally involved in the process so that their knowledge can influence what we find out and not be devalued or ignored. I think it's a terrific development. I think if you really want to uh, make it possible for there to be equal involvement in research, there are a number of key steps. You must make sure that in a non-tokenistic way, service users and our organisations are in at the heart of developing research proposals. They need to be there in a real and evidence way in carrying it out. It doesn't mean everyone has to be a service user, but they have to, there has to be evidence 
that there, in the governance of the research there is an equality between those with experience of using services and those with experience of research and recognition that some people have got both identities. Um, and then I think critically funders are going to have to change how they allocate money for research. And they've started to do that, but we've a long way to go. And when you have a, a situation as we do now, for example, in mental health research, where most of it is medicalized, an awful lot of it is funded by the big pharmaceutical companies, and the preoccupation of most research is developing new drugs and how those drugs work, because of course that's what those pharmaceutical companies are primarily concerned with and influence the research agenda. There, there was work done, uh, an occasion was set up uh, by the government, by a government department, to bring together uh, non-medicalised, uh, non non-professional uh, researchers, service user researchers, and then more traditional researchers. And I'm, I was there and I was part of it. And what was fascinating was that the agendas we each had were completely different. The agendas of the traditional research, I'm not saying it hasn't improved since then, but the agendas of the traditional researchers were very medicalised, you know, about responding medically to the particular... Whereas what the service users had to say was, well, let's, let's look at our social situation and how our social situation, through challenging loneliness, through helping us maintain our relationships, through finding ways that we can get support that we feel works, not just in office hours, can be available. That's the sort of res research we want very different from what then the experts, traditional experts, were saying. There's been a lot of talk amongst service users of user-led or partnership work in research and in other aspects of, of the things that people get involved in. In, in recent years, people have begun to talk about co-production and from my experience, co-production was not a concept that came from service user movements. I think it came from other places where people wanted to work in more equal ways. Um, and the trouble with co-production as a term, of course, like all these terms, is that different people mean different things. They can end up being jargonistic and it's not necessarily very clear what we really mean by it. I believe that if you, if you just say to a group of people as service users, OK, we'd like to involve you in a co-producing way in doing this, it's not going to be real co-production. We, all of us, and, and I'm including myself, and I went to college, you know, I went to university, did a degree, but when things went wrong for me in mental health terms, you realise that, you know, you are disempowered and you have to start relearning. And, and I think that if, if people haven't had those advantages that I had, um, then they're not used to working in, in group situations uh, to do things that they haven't done before with people who might be quite important and powerful, uh, that, 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 that they're not used to the language they use, the sorts of ways they work, then you are setting a, something up to fail. So I, I, I know the word also has its own problems, but I think it's helpful to think about in the concept of empowerment if you're going to think about co-production. I think you need to think about empowerment before you think about co-production. And I think empowerment is a wonderful idea in its origins. It's been devalued since. And I, I trace its origins to the black civil rights movement. And what I think is really wonderful about this idea of empowerment is it's two things coming together. First of all, what it it recognises when you talk about empowerment is that if people are going to be an activist, do things, affect their life, rethink themselves, not have to feel, oh, I'm disabled, it's all my fault, which some people were traditionally encouraged to think, then they're going to need through a, to go through a process of empowerment, what they call personal empowerment. You're going to need to have opportunities to rethink your life, uh, your attitudes, with people who've been through that journey with shared experience. And that's why user-led organisations are so helpful, because that's something else they can do. They can be a place where you can, like women's groups or black groups, where you can no longer just have to accept what you were told, uh, 
in your inferior status, but now think about it again. And as part of that process, feel, yes, that's true, and gain in confidence, in assertiveness, in skills. You need all of that to be an equal member of a, a process like doing research. It's ridiculous to say that somebody who's a service user, whose experience is being a service user, is on a level pegging in relation to research with someone who has had a good education and has gone through a whole process of becoming a researcher. So both need to get up to speed. The service user needs to get some of that empowerment element and the researcher used to working with other researchers needs to have some support to learn how to work with service users. Inequality, with equality. That's the first half of empowerment, the personal bit. And then it, the second bit is being in a position through being personally empowered to work to make social, political, cultural change. Uh, and the two are obviously all bound up with each other. I don't think you can do the second except being a bit of a stage army. You know, you're there, but you're not really part of it without personal empowerment. But if it stops at personal empowerment and then people are then telling you what to do and you're not really... So I think co-production can be a good idea. We should not use it lightly. I've been involved in things that I would see as co-production. Um, but they've been well worked out, well rehearsed, and people have been committed uh, to that kind of an idea and in a position to take it forward. Then it's great. My, my advice to someone embarking on a PhD who wants to co-produce, do it in a collaborative way, um, or as, as an early career researcher, is you could have chosen an easier task. Let's, let's get real. It will not make your life easier. You will worry that you aren't doing it as well as you want to, that you aren't involving people as fully, that, for example, a PhD does not really allow you properly to co-produce because you only allowed your name on it, that as an early career researcher, you will be probably at the beck and call of more, quotes, important people who may want to press you in other directions. But if you're having all these worries, you are likely to be the right person to try and do it. Because if you don't worry about any of those things, that's when I would be very worried. I have to say I had, generally speaking, very positive experiences as a, an academic who, who identified as a mental health service user. I, I started off by going to a college uh, which had always determinedly sought to encourage diversity and support it, both uh, in its workforce uh, and in its student population, um, in terms of, first of all, women uh, being treated with equality and then uh, people from ethnic minorities and so on. Uh, and then that college became part of a bigger university, Brunel, and my experience was similarly positive there in the sense that I started as a lecturer and I went on to become bit by bit a professor. And that, I think, was an indicator, a clear indicator of not being uh, discriminated against. But I need to say something personally, which is that I quickly realised working in a university um, that I could not not identify as a mental health service user. I would, I would have to tell people. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to cope with um, like hiding it. I've, I've got friends and colleagues who've had to do exactly the opposite. Uh, and then I found that, not, not going on about it, but just being clear, that then sometimes students would approach me and, and raise issues about their own experience. Uh, and then I would have a conversation with them about it if they wanted to. And I felt that was a useful role to play, having a shared experience. The, the thing about universities is that in recent years, as they've been expected in the UK more and more to stand on their own two feet, and there have been tuition charges for students, um, they've become much more pressured places, much more difficult places to work in. Uh, and I think that there's no question that that has created all sorts of issues around the mental health of people working in universities. 
uh, and that's been documented uh, by trade unions who've talked to their members working in universities. Ironically, funnily enough, because I was a mental health service user and therefore a disabled person, under equalities legislation, I could make a case for reasonable adjustments to enable me to work to my best by making adjustments in how I worked. So the, 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 the issue for me, and it's kind of like contradictory, was that some of the pressures that my colleagues might be facing might be met for me because I had already had a, a disabled person identity under legislation. And it, this is a really complex issue. The truth is that nowadays you cannot go and work anywhere safely without declaring your true identity because at some point it will catch up with you, uh, possibly, and then you, you've had it, um, just like with insurance policies. And these things are getting more and more tense and uh, conflictful. I, I, I don't think there's, there are easy suggestions I can make to someone, for example, as a disabled person or a mental health service user about embarking on a career in academia. Universities are stressful places, but you can do good things in them. I, I think it's fantastic the number, the growing number of PhDs, of research posts that people with, with these kinds of experiences are now getting. Uh, but it isn't going to be a simple road. But then perhaps your feeling will be, as a service user, I'm not expecting a simple road. You, you will have to be, uh, it's like all forms of discrimination. You'll all, you will feel you have to do the equivalent of running where someone else walks. You have to do things that much better than, than you know what I mean? It's, it's all those things. But there are a load of us around now. It's more difficult to, to diss people in that situation. I just wish everyone the very best and, and hope that they can find sources of support. I'm always happy when people get in touch with me and ask for, for guidance or suggestions and it's nice to meet them and to talk about it. I, I hope what I've said has been helpful to some of you at least. Um, I'm sorry I can't be with you. Um, I know that the work you're doing is really important and really useful. If anybody would like to get in touch with me, then please do feel free uh, and I, uh, we can let you have uh, an email address to do that with. And I do hope that the rest of the day uh, is, is really good and I wish you uh, every success in your participatory and co-producing futures. Thanks a lot.